Hello, welcome to this very special edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace, reporting from this year's 2023 New York City Winter Jazz Festival. At the beginning of January of this year, the New York City Winter Jazz Festival hosted over 150 acts performing in venues both in New York City as well as Brooklyn, as well as held special seminars pertaining to the world of jazz. I was honored this year to cover one of the main acts for this festival, bassist, composer, and producer Jamaluddin Takuma. Now Jamaluddin has had a very, very unique and prolific career playing with the likes of Carlos Santana, The Last Poets, as well as Pharrell Sanders, as well as the great Ornette Coleman. Jamaluddin performed a very unique and special set at this year's 2023 New York Winter Jazz Festival at Superior Ingredients in Brooklyn with his group Jet Set, which features Billy Martin on drums, Lee Odom on saxophone and flute, Brandon Lopez on bass, and Paul Geis on trumpet and electronics. Now this concert was a hybrid of a bit of fusion as well as a bit of avant-garde, and you'll see tonight here on The Pace Report. Right after the show, I had a chance to sit down with Jamaluddin to talk about one, his origins growing up in Philadelphia and how he was exposed to the bass. And we'll reflect on one of the most important figures of the electric bass, the great Monk Montgomery, who was the brother of the legendary guitarist, Wes Montgomery. We also sit down and talk about some of his influences, including the great Odin Pope, as well as Pat Martino, who also hail from his native Philadelphia, as well as we reflect on the great Reggie Lucas and James Ntume, who introduced him to a very important jazz icon, the late NEA jazz master Ornette Coleman. So sit back, relax, and enjoy highlights of Mr. Jamaluddin Takuma, performing with his group Jet Set, live at Superior Ingredients in Brooklyn, New York, as part of this year's 2023 New York City Winter Jazz Festival here on The Pace Report. Put your hands together for Mr. Paul. Hey! 
I guess I will say Mr. Coleman, but the 80s was my foray into Grammar Vision. Okay. And I've noticed that through the last 40 years, you have played and done a myriad of different music projects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tell my viewers what went down on that band stage. Okay. Night. Well, it's, it's interesting that, but first of all, Brian, it's, it's cool to, to be here with you. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been a while that we've been trying to get together, and I'm glad that you've been just following. So you've been following what I've been doing, which justifies what we're doing now. And basically, on Saturday night at the uh, at the concert, uh, I put together these guys that I knew that the chemistry would work. You know, um, I wanted to. I mean, I, I just wanted to be able to express everything that those guys were able to do to the to the audience. Um, one might say with Brandon Lopez. Well, you know, we've seen Brandon Lopez. He's, 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 he's he, you know, he, he's crazy at what he's doing, but I like the fact that he, he goes at it, you know. He doesn't care. He, 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 he takes that bass to another, uh, to another level. So folks are probably trying to figure out, like, what is he going to do with Jamal Adin? And so having all of those individuals there that contributed what they do made up the chemistry. Billy is a, basically a, a musician who, Billy Martin is basically a musician who is a composer, and he also thinks of the drums and the percussion as a, as instruments that, you know, he can express himself musically. Um, Lee Odom is a saxophonist that's coming up really strong here in New York. I had the opportunity to do work with her with The Shape of Jazz to Come for Peace with Ornette that Gennardo produced, and I had a chance to meet her then, and, we, and, and I think we met before then as well. Um, Paul Geis is a trumpeter from Philadelphia who I produced his, um, his, one of his records, his first record actually on Rope and Dope. Um, and you know, it's just, be, it just being able to bring all of those different elements together that had that result. And I wanted to groove and I wanted to, make, I wanted to make, have the music go through compositional improvisation and I wanted to make sure that the crowd was able to relate to it and to groove right along with us. There's a lot of layers of this interview I want to cover. Um, first of all, let's start with the bass. Mm -hmm. uh, Leo Fender mm -hmm. in the early 50s okay. created the electric bass. Come on, come on. And the first person, mm -hmm. and I'm partial to say this because mm -hmm. I'm from Indianapolis. Okay. Monk Montgomery. Absolutely, come on with it. Was the first come to actually play with it. Now, right. 52, 53 is when he started playing the electric bass. Now. Right. Let's fast forward to 61, 62 mm -hmm. in Detroit. And there were these little guys in the snake pit right. on West Grand Boulevard called the Funk Brothers. Right. And James Jameson kind of took what Monk Montgomery started with, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but took the bass and put it in the forefront. Right. And then towards the end of the 60s, we have guys like Larry Graham, mm -hmm. Stanley Clark, mm -hmm. and in the 70s, we get into 
those guys mm -hmm. and Jaco Pastorius, mm -hmm. where the bass mm -hmm. is moved into the solo aspect of what right. electric guitar is. Right. How was that upbringing as far as listening to the bass in your forebrain? Okay. How did that come up? Well, first of all, Brian, I, I, I want to commend you on mentioning Mark Montgomery because that's the man. And let me tell you something. When you think about the bass guitar, first of all, I'm doing a project with Mark Montgomery. Mark Montgomery and, and Charlie Christian called Two Groove Electric. Basically, Mark Montgomery being the first one to bring that bass to the forefront. And the interesting thing about it, in 1951, when Leo Fender designed the, the, uh, the, the Fender Precision Bass, um, he gave it. He gave it to to Lionel Hampton, because Lionel Hampton had the hottest band that was jumping off at the time. Mark Montgomery was in his band. So, and there's a there's a there's an ad, uh, a, a paper ad, that with showing Lionel Hampton holding the Fender bass, precision bass. So that was the first thing, and then he gave it to Mark Montgomery. Mark Montgomery played it, you know, all around, recorded with it. So it's very interesting to me and very special to me. When you think about the bass guitar, you know, a lot of times, you know, they're promoting the white guys playing the bass guitar, blah, 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 blah. But a black man was the one who first started playing the bass guitar around, you know, recording with it and playing with it. And that's monumental. Right. That's monumental. And and so when when you think of um, Uncle Montgomery and, and, and when you listen to the early master sounds, you know, the group that he was with, with his brother Buddy Montgomery, he was trying to solo. He was trying to move around on that thing. He was trying to play. He was trying to play melodies, you know. And that's very interesting and very monumental as well. You take that up to the point where, in 1970, even after all of those other cats, Jocko and 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 Stanley and Alphonse Johnson and all those guys who were, you know, leaning towards trying to play more, you know, melodic things. Uh, even Mark Montgomery did a record in Philadelphia, yeah. produced by uh, um, George. Uh, I mean, What's his name? Bobby Martin, who worked with Tom Bell, you know, and all those guys in the Philly International Records, and some of the guys from Philly International Records uh, musicians, uh, like Norman Harris on guitar, uh, Earl Young on drums. They, they, they were the ones in 1971 when Kenny Gamble first started Philly, Philly International, did all of those songs for the stylistics for the Delphines, blah 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 blah. They played on Mama Montgomery's record. So from that point, 51, until that point where they started to do it, the bass was progressing. Now, here comes Jamal and Takuma and Ornette Coleman. Now, Ornette actually just takes me and just kind of molds me thinking about the bass in a completely different way. It, it being an instrument that is completely, now, now it's unapologetic. It's an instrument that is completely one level, balanced, equal to any, any instrument on earth, right? And so we were compositionally pr pr playing, improvising, and I had to learn all of those melodies that he had, all the melodies that Ornette had. I had as a bass player. <laughs> yeah, I didn't care if he was a bass player. If you play in this band, you gonna have to learn this melody because we're not just up there jamming. We're gonna be able to take these compositions and play from that. So I had to learn all of those melodies. And so for me, at that point, it just actually just took. You know, I mean, I, I feel as though that it took the bass to another level compositionally and equality with all other instruments on stage. Now. When it comes time to groove and to hold that thing down, one has to be able to understand to do that too. But when that moment is over and when you want to go into the stratosphere in terms of playing, like, you know, playing compositionally, you should be able to do that as well. So Saturday night, that's what I was trying to do. We got to go back to something that I brought up in my dialogue and James Jamerson. Mm -hmm. James Jamerson, now, right. This, this, this is important because... From my understanding, the very first song that you tried to learn on right. bass right. was right. the Temptations. Temptations, right? Get ready, get ready, and I try to. And it's funny. Um, now this is like, okay, now this is the. Um, what happened was in North Carolina, where my family is from, White Whiteville, North Carolina. Um, my aunt had a, um, uh, and my uncle had a tobacco farm. So my mother used to send me there every summer to sort of escape the gangs and stuff that was happening in Philly. So I would go down there every, in, during the summertime, and I, one day I noticed in the corner there was a, a, a guitar, an old guitar sitting in the corner, and it only had like four strings on it. Most guitars have six strings, so this only had four strings, and I'm sure the thing wasn't in tune because nobody in the house played it. And I was trying to ask everybody who did that thing belong to. Nobody knew who it just appeared. I found out later that it, was, it belonged to my, one of my other cousins who lived across the street and just happened to be in there. So I pick it up. 
and I learned how to play get ready on one string because I didn't know how to you know I didn't know how to move around with you know you know the guitar itself but I learned how to play do 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 right you know just using that one string to do that now the interesting thing about that is James Jameson played with one finger right you know so that so to me you know as you mentioned that 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 brought that to mind yeah because when when you when we talk about James mm -hmm. and the, the evolution of of bass guitar right and there's some rock basses we're not going into them now but when I listen to James when I hear just my imagination right it's poetic when you're interpreting and playing the bass mm -hmm. how are you inter internalizing your style because sometimes people can write it down and explain it mm -hmm. Dr. Barry Harris was very good at explaining mm -hmm. bebop and monk, mm -hmm. how do you internalize and explain playing the bass in your style? Um, well, first of all, it's just flowing. Um, I'm not. It's it's a natural thing where I'm really not thinking about it. It's just um, if I'm thinking about melody, if I'm thinking about um, playing in the context where everybody's sort of creating and improvising at the same time, I'm thinking of the melody. But if it's a groove scenario, I'm thinking about locking with the drummer. You know, keeping that groove thing happening, and that's that's a feat all by itself. Because now you got a lot of bass players like doing gymnastics. No, can you just sit down on that groove for like five minutes straight? Can you lay into that? Can you lay into that thing and like form a, a hypnotic thing that you know it transcends from the bass to to the person that's listening? You know, and 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 as you mentioned, like that, um, those all of those things that James Jameson did was absolutely magnificent and a lot of the bass players that they all patted themselves after him yeah all the guys that that played electric fender basses after that they patted themselves after 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 james you know and james you know and a lot of and, and there is a um a, an interesting documentary called standing in the shadows of motown mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it features the story of the funk brothers right and what a lot of people don't understand those musicians that were in the snake pit, mm -hmm. James Jamerson, uh, Ronald White, all of those guys, they were jazz musicians. They were jazz musicians. Look, let me tell you something. There's a group called Willie and the Mighty Magnificence. Willie and the Mighty Magnificence was the backup band for um, uh, Sylvia Robinson and her husband, Joe Robinson. They had a, the moments. The moments. Okay. All of that stuff that you hear from the moments, the whatnots, Linda, Linda, jo Linda Jones, yeah. all the stuff that came out of Jersey. Uh, Willie and the Mighty Magnificence was the backup band for them, and they basically um, had a bass player named Val Burke. He was the one who I first saw that turned me on when I was, you know, just looking. There's a theater in Philadelphia called the Uptown Theater, which is just like the Apollo in New York, where all the groups would play at doing their R&B stuff, doing their songs, you know, touring around. And they called it the Chitlin Circuit, or whatever. But they would all play around that. And and one night, one day, I was in the at the, at the Uptown looking at a concert, sitting in maybe the third row or whatever, and Val was playing, and, and, and all of a sudden he took his hands off this, he was doing a solo, they were probably playing something like Higher from, from a, a, a Slide of Fan and Stone, and he was soloing, he took his hands off the bass and started <laughs> blowing his fingers like there was a fire. I was like, what? That was it for me. And so that whole concept of, of what James Jameson brought, all of those guys, all of those musicians, Sort of gravitated towards that, you know, in terms of like approaching the bass and that sound, those round wild strings before um, flat round strings before round wilds became popular with the bass guitar, they were all playing that um, round wild string. I mean, the flat string, flat round strings, and they all were coming from actually the early Motown records was done on an upright bass. Yeah. So they were all everybody that was who was leaning leaving the acoustic bass going to electric was kind of approaching it like that. If you look at a lot of the the uh, the early electric bass players, they weren't holding their bass like that. They were holding it like that, you know, kind of upwards with playing electric bass like that. So it was a, you know, a good transition. <laughs> Thank you. 
And I bring those two groups up because 68, 69, 70, right. black American music was changing again, again. Again. And and, and you had right. you had Larry Graham mm -hmm. and then you had Bootsy Collins right. who again were doing some very unique things on the bass. And funk was just now in its evolution. Right. Now for me, um, growing up in Philadelphia. That's where I started at. I started out listening to War, Mandrill, uh, 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 Rufus, uh, uh, Cold Blood, Chicago, um, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, you know, all of the early Mother's Finest. We listened to all that stuff. And so there was this problem with Funkadelic. So there was this, this transition from a, the singing group concept, you know, to the more self contained band thing. And everybody was clean. Everybody was sharp, everybody was colorful, everybody was doing their thing. And so you had that transition from, from that situation because even before Parliament Funkadelic became Parliament Funkadelic, they were the Parliaments. Right. And if you look at some of their older photos, you know, they, they're sitting there, they, you know, they dressed like the Temptations. So you had, and, and the Sly and the Family Stone was the same thing, you had um, all of those groups that were transforming themselves from the singing group, you know, doo-wop kind of scenario to more self-contained thing. And so the music became more funkier, the music became more rocker, more rockier, the, the clothing became more uh, uh, psychedelic, the, 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 the hairstyles became longer, you know, and, and, and the jamming became even more intense, you know. What is it about Philadelphia that produces some hell of fine organ organs? Yeah, I think, um, I think just, it's just, you know, one after the other. They all check each other out, and they all being inspired by by each other, and they just try to keep moving that thing forward. Because even Joey Di Francesco, he um, was a, a phenomenal organist, you know, uh, in the tradition of those guys that were doing that that stuff before. Sure, it's got all those people that were doing that stuff were, were were absolutely you know phenomenal at doing what they were doing, as far as the organ was concerned, and um, even 
in the local bands that was happening in Philadelphia, you know, if you didn't have a B3 organ on stage with you, you know, you wasn't having it. So the organ was a really important, um, uh, you know, feature in Philadelphia, as well as bass guitars, you know, bass, bass players. And drummers. Drummers too, yeah, yeah, yeah drummers yeah, yeah, too, yeah. drummers too. What is it, you have a project, and I, I saw you play this last summer mm -hmm. at a, uh, Marcus Garvey Park in Harlem, okay. The Last Poets. Those guys, to me, really are really the fathers of hip-hop. Mm -hmm. And spoken word has always been part of black American music. Right. By way of the shout, um, the, you know, the field shouts. Right. Um, what was it about working and collaborating with the last poets. I know there's another part of your musicianship of collaborating, but mm -hmm. what was it about these guys that you, you connected with? Well, yeah, well, again, during that same period, you know, we're talking late 60s, 70s, uh, late 60s, mid 60s, late 60s, 60s 70s. Um, when my introduction to jazz music came about in the barber shop, you know, there was a barber there named Sonny, and he would cut everybody's hair, and he would have a uh, station in Philadelphia, WRTI, playing. And they would be playing all the all the jazz stuff, and I think some of the early jazz things that I heard was like Freddie Hubbard or Lee Morgan or whatever, and and so it was um, um, it was important for me to try to like tap into what was going on uh, uh, musically with all of those individuals contributing to the total sound that was happening in Philadelphia. You know, it was important for me to do that. So jazz was happening. R&B was happening. Um, Latin music came later because of my high school. I, I was a, my high school had the only Latin band because I lived in an area in Philadelphia that had a lot of the Latin community there. So we was the only high school in Philadelphia that had a Latin band. So that contributed to to everything as well. You know their albums. You know the, this is madness. It's right. my favorite favorite record right. by them. You know, the times were changing. They spoke of what was happening. Do you find that now music doesn't speak of the times now? Do you think the music well, is becoming even, disposable? Well, even then, during that period, when I first heard The Last Poets, they were they were talking about what was going on at the time. You know, there was a lot of things. Um, unfortunately, there's not much there. You know, when you listen to their earlier stuff that I first listened to when I first found out about them, when I was listening to jazz, when I first found out about jazz, um, when you look at the things that they were talking about, when you look at things now, it's, it's, it's a lot of things that are still similar. Um, they were talking about the plight of, of, of black folk, what, what we needed to do to, to be able to, to upgrade ourselves, what was happening around us that was keeping us down, the things that we were aware of that they wanted to talk about that would make other people aware of it, that weren't aware of it, that weren't in the community that, that didn't know. And for me, the connection that I had with them musically at the time, when I did that record with them, when I produced a record for them, it was an opportunity for me to try to still extract all of those stories, all of those things that they, that they were talking about then. So I find myself in a, in a place where, wow, I'm working with the last poets. And it, it, was, it, was, it was kind of surreal in that, I had the opportunity to just be in, to put myself inside first. Check out what they were doing. You know, when I'm producing a record, I'm not. I'm, it's not a producer's record. It's a record that I'm thinking about what it is as artists. What is it? What it is that you want to do? What it is that you want to express? And I basically helped them do that. And so here I am at the helm of the ship, working with these guys who were who were you know masters at what they did in terms of the the, the spoken word. And so for me, it was important to try to get that story, continue on with that story, to continue on with that. Now, what I wanted to do, my little input, um, was to bring some musicality to it. And what I, what I wanted to do, I didn't want to have a record where it was sort of, you know, I'm sitting in a room with my computer and I'm putting together beats and I'm, you know, I'm going to say, okay, y'all just come in the studio and do your thing on top of this. No, I wanted to have the integration, I wanted to have the collaboration of the live musicians together with them to be able to bring about a kind of an organic, you know, live situation for with the music with the last poets. As a producer, 
do you find it now at your age it's easier to groom and bring out the best of the artists or do you have a, a hard time working with artists who kind of are reluctant to new ideas to bring the music out um no most of the time i think because i'm, I'm the elder statesman now you know even in the front of the at the door you know they give me respect and and i give them respect back but i, I mean i don't look i don't look to that like you know you got to give me respect no they see what I do. They've seen what I've done. I don't have to, you know, come and beat my chest or whatever. They know that they're going to get, and, and once we get involved with the project and they see that the organization is right, you know, my concern for them in the studio, my concern for them outside of the studio, because not only, the, you know, when we finish a project, it's like, okay, so now what are you going to do? Are you going to just like, just have this record in hand or are you going to take this record and go out in the world and do your thing with it? You know, so and then I'm really cautious about who I'm working with. If they're crazy, I ain't working with you. <laughs> if you're drunk all the time, I ain't working with you. If you're high all the time, I ain't working with you. So it's like you know. So already in my 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 my, my orbit is folks that are cool. You know what I'm saying? If it's the musicians or if it's the, if the artist is cool, then we can we can get down with something that's really nice. And so you know, if we're in the studio and I'm saying that something is not coming off right, I'll just pull myself and say, look, try this, try this try that you know um, you might find that this might work better for you you know and they they might even have a suggestion for me you know but their suggestion has it because I've been around long enough to know right you know if, if the suggestion that you that you're giving me ain't cool I'm gonna say no I'm gonna say no because ultimately at the end of the day your name is going to be on this thing my name is going to be on this thing and we want to make sure that this thing is going to come out now not to say I know everything no but I've been around long enough to know if that's going to work with that if that's going to work with that, then we're going to put that together. And then you're going to see that, and then I'm going to be like, okay, see you later. You may, then later on, you'll be like, oh, yeah, that did, that, that is that is worth, you know. It's just like, for example, the concert that we did the other night. I don't want those guys to come up there with a t-shirt on. If you notice that, it was sort of a color-coordinated kind yeah. of concept. And that and, and and so they probably weren't thinking about that initially. You know, they would say, Oh, we just gonna do a gig. I said, No, it's a whole it's a whole it's a whole thing. Presentation. It's a whole presentation. You know, and that's what and, and, and that's how I came up. You know, you, you talked about the Parliament Farmer Dollar, you talked about uh um, Slide and Family Stone, you talked about all these groups. That's how they came through. Right. You know, and it's no difference with me. So you I meet a younger artist that I'm working with or producing or whatever. Um Take a look at this. Check this out. And they they might not see it, but you know when it, when the project comes out, or the cover comes out, or you know the, the, you know whatever it is that's put together for them when it comes out, they can see that this was actually pretty cool to do it like that. You know, and I could be wrong a lot of times, but you know for the most part, you know I'm planning everything throughout these forty years, as you say. <laughs> all, all these moves have been you know strategic. You know. Thank you.
The maestro Ron Carter had a saying, we, we have some musicians that have left the stage. Mm -hmm. And some of these musicians you've collaborated and worked with, in fact, one of the guys I want to talk about is the great James Entume mm -hmm. and Reggie Lucas. Uh, James left us last year, yeah. and he, those two guys were responsible for yes. you getting the call to play with Ornette. With, with Ornette, yeah. With, um, you know, doing this little stint that I had in um, with Charles Erlin, um, well, first of all, I, didn't, I had a scholarship, after coming out of high school, I had a scholarship to go to Berkeley. And I decided I didn't want to go to Berkeley College of Music because I wanted to be a musician that was on the road. I wanted to get that kind of an education, which I think is, is was worked out a lot better for me. I can't say what it did for everybody else. Although I see a lot of those guys that, you know, it was kind of a cookie cutter situation. I, I wasn't cut out to do that. And, and I wanted to, to pretty much be um, individual and be creative uh, in my own way. So I decided not to go to college. I played with Charles Earl and, uh, and then coming home from um, Newark, New Jersey, where Charles Earl fired me, you know, uh, uh, he said because my timing was off, but I think it was because I was a young guy that was wearing, you know, white shoes and a gold guitar strap. And, you know, when I play a solo, the audience would go crazy. So, you know, you know being, you know, sort of old school, you know, the concept of the young guy that comes in, you know, he's got to pay his dues. And I don't think he was really kind of ha having that. So, <laughs> so I come home crying, you know, my mom said, come on, baby, so I'm 18 years old. And one week later, I get a call from Reggie and, 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 and James. They said, look, man, this, this guy, a uh, friend of ours named Ornette Coleman, um, you know, he's uh, going to, he wants, you know, put the, put, he wants to put a band together, a young band, um, and they, he wants to go to Europe for two weeks, and uh, would you be interested in auditioning? Now, I have, remember, I didn't know much about Ornette, but I remember seeing a uh, an old 1950s downbeat magazine in, in my high school library and it was a picture of Ornette playing the violin not even the saxophone playing the violin so I said yeah sure I would check it out so I came to New York um, you know so-called audition for Ornette and and um, he said yeah I like you know I like for you to go on tour with me and we're supposed to go for two weeks and we wound up staying in Europe for six months but in two James and and, and Reggie they were responsible for me um, having that you know that gig and um they went on as you know to become they were they were actually oh, they R &B yeah, R &B, you know producers. songwriters and producers and they were at the time they were with miles and they would have had liked to have gone and play with ornette as well but they couldn't because they was with miles and miles was like you can't you, 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 you're not going to just get up and leave, <laughs> leave, leave, leave me like right, that right yeah. you know tunes had two two careers the writing the producing right and then he became, you know, a talk show host and an activist. Right, right. And, and, and television score. For yeah, the, yeah, yeah, for uh, New York Undercover. Yeah. Uh, Archie Shep is still with us. Right. Um, I had the honor of hanging out with him and his homeboy, literally homeboy, Reggie Workman. Okay, yeah. They were childhood, fr they're childhood friends. Mm -hmm. And um, Archie's another person in your life that you've collaborated with. Yeah. Tell me what Archie Shep means to you. As a Philadelphia, as a Philadelphia, yeah. You know, it's funny because during that period, during that seventies period, that's also the kind of things that we were listening to. There was an organization in Philly called Ile Ife, which was an African drum group, uh, drum troupe, and there we would also hear like you know Lee Morgan and all the Philly guys, and of course Archie Shep was on heavy rotation during that time, and also the I had the opportunity to work and from someone from that same period was um, uh, Leon Thomas. The Whistler. The Whistler, yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, you know, working with him, being in the studio producing, 
with him in there, that was very interesting. You know, um, what was he like? He was he was magical. He was magical. He was he was calm. He was always cool. He was. Um, and then when you look at the stuff that he did with Santana, I think that was a gift yeah. that Santana had. That that probably I mean, I know that he realized it, but I mean, you know, that was that was a gift for Santana to have have Leon Thomas in the band. Right. And and those lyrics and things that he would come up with, praising God, you know, uh, along with Pharaoh, that 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 was some really. Now they talk about spiritual jazz now. They you know they try to turn that, but that's that was the real spiritual jazz. He was time. ahead of his time at this time. Ahead, ahead of his time, yeah. So to be in the studio with him, me in the, at the control booth, you know, producing, that 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 was that was that was something. And I also had that experience with someone who's still living, um, Taj Mahal. You know, we have a record that that has not been released, and yet it hasn't been released yet. I'm thinking about you know probably releasing it. But he was another one. I'm sitting in the control booth as a young guy, me and this engineer named Greg Man. I had to be like 25 years old or whatever, and I'm sitting there, you know, directing him. And he's like, okay, now what you want me to do now? <laughs> you know, he's like, come on, man, I gotta go. I was like, oh, all right, let's try to get this take right, you know. T yeah. Taj is <laughs> one of my bucket list interviews. I, okay. I, I gotta break bread with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because again, and it goes back to what we're talking about, the grill, the, the last poets. Mm -hmm. The spoken word is very important. The blues is, I always tell people about black music, mm -hmm. and this is where the, the, the theologians get it wrong. Mm -hmm. You can't have gospel without the blues. Right. You can't have jazz without the blues. You can't have hip hop without the blues. Right. I mean, if you look at Nas, mm -hmm. the rapper, his father's Olu Dara. Right. Who's on my first album? That, I, I'm, 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 we're going to that. We're going right. to that. We're going right. to that. You know, Nas is really an extension of his father mm -hmm. in the tradition of the oral tradition. Right. What was Oludara like? Again, mellow, cool. Uh, when I did the record, him and uh, Julius Hemphill, yeah. they came to Philly. I was a young boy. I was up here in New York. I said, look, I'm doing my record. They came in, um, they came to Philly, and they, 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 came, they got in the studio. And then it was interesting how Olu approached his solo because I was, I was like, I was like, you know, I was, I was, I was kind of clear about how I wanted the, the the sequence of the solos to go. I wanted Julius to do the first solo, and I wanted Olu to do the second solo. And so, you know, Julius starts, you know, he starts his solo. You know, you know, you know, you know, sixteen notes, and then Olu came, and he was like, completely different. And I ain't dig it at the time. I was like, oh, I want you to play like, you know, I, I didn't say anything, but I was like. But the more I listened to it, I was like, oh, I see. I see how he approached that, which was much different than the way that Julius did it. Because they weren't trying to prove anything. They were already master musicians. They, they could have played, they didn't have to play 16 notes or whatever. They, but, you know, that's what Julius did, did because he wanted to start it off like that. The, you know, it was, a, it was a kind of a swing thing. So he wanted to start it off like that. But Olu uh, completely changed the vibe up on that. And then... I had a singer named Barbara Walker. She's a local Philadelphia singer, and she was kind of timid, you know, because I wanted her to do something different. If you listen to, uh, if you listen to that piece, Showstopper, the way she's approaching it, she's not doing, she's not approaching it like a Ella Fitzgerald, scatty kind of thing, you know. She she did this thing, and I was like, you know, try this, try this, and, and Julius and, and Olu was really supportive in trying to calm her, calm her down to do what she needed to do. And so that was really interesting. Also, in terms of uh, Nas uh, and his father, Olu, you have um, uh, the, the, the cellist, uh, Dawu, um, what's his name, Dawood, um, and his son is, um, I forget the son's name, but he's a, a, a very famous vocalist. Really? You know, as well. Okay. You know, I'll send you the name. Yeah, I'll okay. send you that name, yeah. Jamal Adin. I'd like to personally congratulate and thank the talented Jamal Adin Takuma for his time. Also, I'd like to congratulate and thank the talented Bryce Rosenblum, the artistic director of this year's 2023 New York Jazz Festival, as well as Matt Merowitz and his staff at Alter Media for accommodating me the time and space here at this year's festival at the venues. Also, I'd like to personally thank the staff and management at Superior Ingredients in Brooklyn for their warm hospitality. 
As always, people, please like, share, and subscribe, and leave comments on my page on YouTube and Vimeo, as well as follow me on social media by way of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace. Thank you.